Our founding fathers were booze hounds. So much so that Benjamin Franklin published a dictionary of 228 words that all describe one thing, being blind drunk in the 13 colonies. We love to drink. Colonial Americans were perpetually bombed, especially since water wasn't always clean and accessible. Oh, gross. Many of our nation's most respected men could be found with a glass or two in hand. In fact, Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence uh, yes. while drunk on Madeira. George Washington racked up an epic bar tab of over 160 bottles for just 54 delegates. It's on me. And John keep Adams drinking. went on a seven-week binge, drinking. drinking six keep hours a night drinking. with younger congressmen. Keep drinking. keep drinking. So Franklin took a stab at his peers and published the terms he overheard at local pubs in the Drinker's Dictionary. Here's what they said. I've got corns in my head. Oh, go eat a pudding bag, Thomas. You're one to talk, Washington. You're as dizzy as a goose. I'm jambled. My goodness, Hamilton. You've got a brass eye today. Well, the king was his cousin. Clearly, gentlemen, you're all wasted. Mac and cheese. Fine wine and ice cream. There's something surprising they have in common, and that's Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, founding father, third president, and author of the Declaration of Independence. Pretty impressive resume. But what we should really recognize Jefferson for is being a massive foodie. While serving as the ambassador to France in the late 1700s, he developed a specific appreciation for all things European. While touring Europe, he took detailed notes about modern farming and agricultural techniques. Upon returning to the U.S., he began cultivating his own organic vegetable garden, berry patch, and vineyard. He even had a macaroni pasta machine shipped over and introduced ice cream to his kitchen. After he was elected as president, he brought his passion for food to the White House. He even served one of his favorites, macaroni and cheese, at a state dinner in 1802. Yeah. Even though he didn't come up with the dinner recipes himself, Jefferson helped popularize them by serving them at decadent dinner parties. So next time you reach for your favorite guilty pleasure, say a small thanks to Thomas Jefferson. Mr. President, our taste buds salute you. Celebrities love endorsing presidents, and presidents love celebrity endorsements. And this is the story of the president that started it all. Warren Harding was the 29th president of the United States. Before that, Harding was a pretty generic senator. The New York Times even dubbed him faint and colorless. So how the hell did he win the presidency? Three words, Florence Kling Harding, his wife and shrewd campaigner. Florence had her ear to the ground, Anytime a famous or influential person came to town, she would have them pose for a photo on their front porch. So basically, the first political selfie. Enter Al Jolson, at the time deemed the world's greatest entertainer. He sang, he danced, he even landed the first talking role in a movie. Most importantly, he became the first celebrity to ever endorse a presidential candidate. Harding had several other celebrity endorsements, most notably Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. And guess what? It worked. Warren Harding became our 29th president. And despite going down as one of the worst presidents in US history, his political selfies changed the landscape forever. I have one job, making the best clothing in the world. My name is Martin Greenfield. I used to be Maximilian Grunfeld when I was born, but we, I changed it to make it American because I love this country. <laughs> My craft is very difficult to define because it's many things. I am a maker of clothing. I know how to measure. I know how to fit people. Very few people could match me. I was responsible for all the presidents. Clinton I measured in the White House, Obama measured in the White House, so then I made them perfect suits, we never had to fix nothing. My 
life, as a sad life before I came to America. Because I lost my family. I was left alone. Everybody was dead. We were occupied. Auschwitz was a month later. I was in the concentration camp a year and two months. It was my second day in Auschwitz. There was no more names in the concentration camp, only numbers. When they called me, they sent me to a tailor. The head tailor spoke my language. He was Jewish. They asked me, are you a tailor? No. I said, if you could show me how to make the collar. He says, I'll make you a collar. Show me how to make a collar. The pain is still in my heart about my family. I still dream about my family, like they're alive. But on the outside, you will never know. I didn't think I was going to survive. I was liberated by Eisenhower. General Eisenhower came in when I was 15 and a half years old. And when they walked in, I shook his hand, crying. You saved my life. I came to America September 18, 1947. They gave me the job as a tailor. I told my boss, listen, Eisenhower liberated me. I want you to make him a three-piece suit like I wear myself. He'll like it. Once he had the first three-piece suit, from then on you didn't see Eisenhower and nothing but three-piece suits. So that's how it started. I made sure we dressed all the presidents. Uh, with Obama, first he wanted me to copy a suit. I don't copy anybody. Everybody copies my suit. So uh, if he wants me to make something, I have to measure. Next day, he sends an email. It would be a pleasure to meet you Dad. I'm happy when I'm in the factory. My job is the most important thing in my life. Quality is so important to me because I know that's what kept me in business and that's why I'm here talking to you. Every day I turn off onto an old country road. It's about a mile from the president's, but you can see them. And then you get up to them and you stand next to one and you go, man, these things are huge. How many people on earth can say they've got a collection of presidents in their backyard that you can see from space? I oh, know, there's JFK. <laughs> I have 43 presidents and Ronald. These guys weigh approximately 14 to 21,000 pounds. These things are huge, aren't they? They've been here for about three years, <laughs> and through time, they're starting to enjoy being out here. They've got their wildlife. Wow, got a bee's nest. The weeds are growing up. It's amazing. They amaze me. These statues were once a part of a outdoor park. When the original park had closed its doors, I was asked to destroy the presidents and clean the place up. It hit me, I said, I'm not destroying them. I'm gonna figure out something. The feeling I get from them, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, these guys, they still have strength today that they had when they were alive and forming our country. They mean a lot to me. I want to bring them back to a museum where they can be enjoyed by everybody. Fire stations, big red trucks, flashing sirens, that cool shiny pole. Well, it all dates back to colonial times, and this guy had a little something to do with it. Mm -hmm. That's right, Ben Franklin. Most known for the Constitution, electricity, and the bifocals, mm -hmm. Ben Franklin had a weird obsession with fire safety. On a trip to Massachusetts, Franklin noticed that the good people of Boston were much more fire-savvy than his fellow citizens in Philadelphia. 
Hmm. This got Ben thinking, and he uh -huh. came up with the idea to create a club or society of active men belonging to each fire engine, whose business is to attend all fires with it whenever they happen. Then Ben got weird. He wrote an anonymous letter to his own newspaper as a senior citizen titled Protections of Towns from Fire. Dear Pennsylvania Gazette, the letter encouraged a better fire safety plan and painted a horrifying alternative. People jumping out of windows, breaking their necks, and being burned alive. But it worked. In 1736, the first American volunteer fire department was born, the Union Fire Company. It was comprised of 30 volunteers, and you might know some of them. George Washington, hmm. Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. and Samuel Adams. Oh. That's right, our founding fathers were also firefighters. Soon after, fire companies and clubs sprang up all over Philadelphia and then across the 13 colonies. So thanks to the matchless leadership of Benjamin Franklin, we now have firefighters. Thanks, Ben.